Last week in episode 63, we examined the powerful but little understood technique of tax allocation. To quickly recap, that's the technique where you can get a big edge in the long-term tax game by smartly housing each of the different building blocks of your portfolio, building blocks like taxable bonds, high-growth stocks, slower-growth stocks, etc., in its own best tax bucket. Again, the big three of those tax buckets would be your taxable, tax-deferred, and tax-free accounts. Ultimately, the questions are, which building block should go in which tax bucket? Is it the same for everyone? And does it make a meaningful difference? Today, in part two, we answer those questions by examining five distinct client cases. In each, we measure how much more wealth you'd have at the end of your life by tax allocating in the optimal way versus doing nothing at all and versus outright blundering it. In many cases, getting it right can add tens to even hundreds of thousands of dollars of extra portfolio value. That's money that your uninformed neighbor naively allowed to drift off to the IRS while you, the informed one, were able to retain and deploy it for the things that matter most to you. And when you match this technique with the three other powerful retirement income strategies we've detailed in earlier episodes, namely optimizing your social security claiming strategy, getting the withdrawal sequence right, and possibly using Roth IRA conversions, you've got a powerhouse set of techniques to help you dominate the long-term retirement income game. Finally, you might be wondering why this episode is so doggone long. Well, that's because your co-hosts couldn't resist settling their heated debate in episode 60 about the right amount of Roth IRA conversions for a particular client and whether it might make sense in some cases to go big early. Stay tuned to hear how math, judgment, perhaps a dash of male ego lead Roshan and Eric to opposite conclusions. All that and more right now on the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I am your co-host, Roshan Langani, here as usual with Eric Olson and Adrian Nicholson, ready for another episode. Eric, you're back home. How do you feel? Yeah. Oh, feels great. Although I did, we did a little FaceTime with the grandchildren and the first words out of their mouth was, we miss you, grandma and grandpa. Oh man, I tell you what, I melted. So it's a pretty precious stage of life, but it was a great time and, and happy to be home. Yeah. How about you guys? Did you doing well? Did you run back online and book tickets for your next trip after that conversation? <laughs> Do you know what we did because we're babysitting for, mm, I think, a week at Thanksgiving while uh, our my daughter and son-in-law head out for a wedding. So, uh, yeah, we did book tickets, actually. That'll be a fun week. Yes. Yeah. Great, great. Hey. Yeah, how about you guys? Hey, I'm doing good. I'm happy to be here. It's good to see both of you. have been having a pretty solid week. Um Last weekend, I really didn't do too much. I mean, I was out outdoors a little bit, and I got a little sunburned. So I've wow. been kind of recovering from that a little <laughs> bit, just showing that the warm weather is right around the corner, and just got to be a little bit more uh, cautious when I'm golfing or just hanging outside, like I'm, I've been doing a little bit more lately. Yeah, it's nice to have it mm. warm up and things uh, open up around us. Uh, we're in the uh, D.C. metro area in Virginia. How about you, Eric? Are things... Uh, is it warm enough to do things outside now? Yeah, a couple, let's say about a week ago, it was in the in the 80s here and windows open and actually thinking, man, we should maybe think about turning on the air conditioner here soon. Although we do like that warmth in the breeze, but it's, it has cooled down a little bit this uh, this week. Yesterday we were out and walking and you know, had to wear a few layers, but it's not bitter. It's just springtime. springtime yeah. That's that's yeah nice. I definitely like it getting getting warmer. Uh, I'm going to take us to our topic today. We've got the follow up episode to our our last one on tax allocation, and to give a brief recap, last time we talked about how your investments can be in taxable account like a regular brokerage account, tax deferred like a 401k, 403b or TSP, and tax free like a Roth IRA, and we discussed the merits of placing certain investments in each 
tax uh, bucket for efficient growth and also considering your withdrawals to make sure you get as much as you can versus potentially overpaying in taxes by taking from the wrong bucket. So today, we're uh, last time we talked about the basics of it. Today, we're going to talk about the uh, a, a few different uh, scenarios and outcomes related to that. So we're, last time we talked about what it was, and I think today we'll talk about uh, what I think is a little bit more of the real value. And just to because I, I like giving basic explanations and, and simplifying things, uh, here's why this is important to you. And I'm just comparing tax brackets. I won't even go over what the top is or anything like that. But theoretically, if you can get all your money at the 10% tax bracket, you'd save 2% over going up to the 12. And if you can get all your money in the 10 and 12% bracket, well, now you're saving 10% as opposed to going up to the 22% bracket. So with a little bit of planning, uh, in both areas, one, where you would draw from, and two, where your investments are, we think you can save money in taxes that you can keep keep in your pocket. And taking that even further, that could then either extend your retirement, if you, if you at this time don't have enough to get to age, uh, your target age, I use age 100, and Eric likes using a, a different age based on actuarial tables. Or on the flip side, if, you're, if you have an age you wanna retire, this may help you retire earlier, right? If you're, if you're saying, hey, I'm on track to retire at 67, but I want to retire at 65, this tax allocation could potentially be the difference in those two years. So now that we've started with the basics, uh, Eric, you ran the analysis that we're going to start with today. Can you give us a little bit mm-hmm. of background? Sure. So the background is, is that you know, as we've talked about in previous episodes, there are a variety of maneuvers that you can make with your income strategy during retirement that can move the needle in big, big ways. We've talked about, for example, the optimal point at which to take Social Security. And if you're married, then how to coordinate the optimal, how to how to develop an optimal strategy that is for you as a married couple and how that can amount to literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of difference over your lifetimes in some cases. We also have talked about the question of the withdrawal strategy. And so we, we've in the past talked about whether to pull first from a, a taxable account, a tax deferred account or a tax free account or some mix of them or, you know, or as the case may be, in a sequence, you consuming one and then draining the next and then draining the next. So we've talked about all sorts of ways to optimize that. But today, what we're talking about is the narrower topic of what we'll call tax allocation. And other names for this you may see, is if you've been reading in this area, are asset location as opposed to asset allocation. And in essence, where would you put, for example, the bond component of your portfolio, given the choice between a taxable portion of your portfolio, tax deferred and tax free, where would you put the high growth pieces, et cetera? And we talked about that in detail in part number one. But so in this particular exercise that I did to prepare for today's podcast, what I was wanting to do was to measure the marginal impact, that is to say the isolated impact of just the tax location or tax allocation um, uh, impact after the other things are assumed to have been done at the optimal level for each of the various client scenarios I examined. So, for example, in one case, it was an extensive Roth IRA withdrawal with, pardon me, extensive Roth IRA conversions and and a delayed social the start of social security Actually, Eric, uh, me, coupled I'm with, sorry to interrupt what are the possible so so uh, what are the possible recommendations from this you mentioned Roth conversion delayed social security what else uh, will the potential outcome tell you should be done well it, it is also again the withdrawal sequence and that means so taking from, should I burn through my taxable account first? Should I burn through my IRAs first? Should I burn through my Roth IRAs first? Should I do a mix and match first? You know, what should I, from which of the various pools of wealth, from that at least pools of wealth from a tax standpoint, which of those should I pull from and in what order? 
and in what what ratios. And so as an example, we'll, one might be to say, use a mix, because that's, it's, easy, it, it, it's easy to understand what we're saying. It's, it's burn through one and then go to the next and finish it and then go to the third. But what if you use a mix? Well, in, in the case of you use a mix, you might use a mix up to the top of a certain marginal income tax bracket. But in any case, what we've done with these, these comparisons is to say, what after those things are assumed to have already been optimized, is there any additional edge that these clients can obtain by going one step farther and also using a tax allocation principle? And the answer is in almost all cases, yes. So let me talk about the, we tried to simplify the tax location choice to one of five approaches. So let me just walk through those approaches. Um, actually, before I do that, Roshan or Adrian, do you have any questions or, or comments about what I've said so far? No, I, no, I think it's uh, great, honestly, some of the topics and concepts you and Roshan already brought up, how saying you can implement this strategy and this can extend years of retirement or give you a little bit more money to pull from, I think is uh, is very uh, important and going to be very informative. You can continue, Eric. Yeah, and Eric, just thus okay. far, the things you've mentioned are Roth conversions, tax allocation, and withdrawal sequence, correct? No. Uh, no. So the, the we're talking about four components altogether. And of those components, one is the, uh, in no particular order, social security optimization. Mm -hmm. Number two is the uh, Roth IRA conversion question. Number three is the, the withdrawal sequence from your various buckets of wealth. And number four is the tax allocation question. Perfect. And we're assuming for today's conversation that the first of those three, social security optimization, withdrawal sequences, and Roth IRA conversions are already s settled and we've optimized those. Now what we're trying to see if can we get it even better by going using a fourth approach to optimization, and then in this case, the tax allocation approach. Yeah. And so uh, for everyone listening, when Eric says we've assumed you've taken care of all of that, um, none of these are, are, are easy answers. All of these require... <laughs> Uh, a little bit of analysis and a little bit of a little bit of work in advance. We have touched on social security uh, optimization, Roth conversions, and I don't think we've had a, an episode dedicated purely towards withdrawal sequence, but we have definitely touched on it a lot in multiple episodes. So when Eric assumes this has been done, I just want to make the note to everyone listening: make sure you actually do it and don't assume that that it's been done for you as well, because that also has a major impact. Oh, let me just let me just riff on that for a moment because, honestly, uh, you know, dear listener, it is it is one um, it's one problem I would say in our in our industry that this these approaches that we're talking about today are not widely known, let alone widely practiced, and so in many cases the the approach that an advisor will take. Maybe these, I think most advisors now recognize that they should be doing social security optimization. So I think that's becoming pretty widespread. Uh, I, I do think that some more still are looking at the combination of Roth IRA conversions and, and withdrawal sequences. Although those are, those are relatively few, but it's, it's still rarer to find someone who will look at the tax allocation yeah. question. So yes, we, you should not assume actually that your advisor is astute in these matters and has the software and the, and the inclination to go through this process. Uh, you should, you should f verify that and find out whether or not your advisor is doing that. And if the answer is no, and you love your advisors, stay with your advisor, but find a planner to actually who's sophisticated in these things, who can do the planning part for you, you know, that's a, that's at the very least, I would yeah, say. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I was actually thinking of people who are even uh, maybe doing this analysis on their own, right? Like, uh, I, okay. I, I don't want mm -hmm. them to skip over those, uh, those first three steps, assuming it's been done and go straight to this, <sighs> straight to this either, just because of how 
uh, important it is. And I'll tell you something else I've seen with experience is a lot of times people mm -hmm. without doing any analysis or, or anything like that will just have a plan in their mind. And sometimes being stuck to that plan makes it hard to deviate. So I'll, I'll give you a very brief example. But I have a client who mm -hmm. you know, financially they're doing they're doing great. They're well off. Her plan was always she's going to retire at 62 and start her Social Security then. And um, mm -hmm. and uh, she has actually delayed it. But it took me about three years of working with her to just constantly pepper and show her the data that it made more sense for her to get it later than started at 62 because in her mind mm. she had just all she had made that decision decades ago already right so mm. so sometimes mm -hmm. when you the reason i make that point of of don't assume you've done it already with or without the analysis is sometimes people just say hey um I get a penalty at 62. They tell me my full retirement age is 66 and six months. So I'm going to take it then. Right. And using uh -huh. just what's sometimes you take these things that are that are uh, you think they've been done for you versus the government just setting this up sometimes. Right. And I don't know if you've had yeah. that experience, Eric, but I used to always get people when I would ask them their retirement age, they were like, oh, well, they say it's 65. You know, that's back when Social Security started yes. at 65. And not uh -huh. realizing that, well, that's Social Security, but what do you want to do? <laughs> now that I've derailed well, us for about 10 minutes, let us let me try to bring us, <laughs> bring us back on. So, Eric, let's get back to this fourth step of the tax allocation. As you run this analysis for the clients, there are five possible outcomes, correct? Correct. And what are those So five? let me just describe. Sure. So we, we, in our previous episode, I think got into a little more depth than this. So these are, we're, this is an approach that's just trying to make it super simple to understand what it is that we're doing. Okay. So here, here's, here's the choice. Number one, don't do anything. <laughs> in other words, have identical, have each of your tax buckets, I'll call them your taxable accounts, your tax deferred accounts and your tax free accounts designed in exactly the same way. In other words, don't do any tax allocation strategy. The second approach is, uh, is really the, the, the other alternative is we'll do something okay. <laughs> and, but it's four variations on do something. So variation number one is remember, I'm going to try to keep this simple is to put all uh, or as much of i should say give you know given your risk tolerance so your risk tolerance probably specifies okay i'm you know i'm either aggressive or i'm conservative or i'm someplace in between from that we derive an, ass an assessment or at least an assumption about what's probably roughly the correct amount of or, or ratio of bonds to to stocks and so forth in your portfolio so let's talk about those bonds. If your bonds are half of your portfolio, in the in the, in the first alternative to the do nothing strategy is to put as many of those bonds as you can into your tax deferred accounts, meaning your IRAs, four hundred one ks, four hundred three bs, four fifty sevens, etc. Put those in there, and the other stuff in your Roth IRAs or taxable accounts. Right, I'm just going to summarize that. Okay. So step one was do nothing. If you're in a half stock, half bond portfolio, all of your accounts, taxable, traditional, and Roth in this case, uh, would just be that 50-50 split. Then the first step of do something is to take your interest-bearing investments, the bonds in this case, and try to load those all up in the tax-deferred, which is the 401k traditional IRA, correct? Correct. And failing that, failing that, then even in this simplified model, even though none of the three of us agree with that this is, is optimal, but in this simplified analysis that we're doing, it says, and if you don't have enough room in your IRA to accommodate all of that, then do more of that also in your Roth IRA. In other words, but the bottom line here is, is they're saying, keep those interest bearing things out of your taxable accounts because those are so tax those are going to be it, it's more tax efficient to load your taxable accounts with those things that have a much gentler tax rate 
namely dividends and long-term capital gains. Okay, so that's option number one is to do do something, and and that is to keep those darn bonds out of your taxable account. Now, actually, that approach, that option number one, can be split into two, and the, that option number one, the two splits are do it right now. And option number two is, yes, do it, but do it gradually over time as you are rebalancing your portfolio. Okay, so that, and you might say, well, what's the difference between do it all right now versus delay it over time? Is that it might be that in so doing, you have long some long-term capital gains built up in your taxable accounts that you don't want to, you don't want to get, you don't want to just dump them all at once. So you might want to finesse it. And there's a little bit more, there's a little bit more considerations that work into that particular decision, but just, just think of it as do it all at once or do it, do it a little bit more gradually. Okay. So those are options number one and two. Now how about three and four? So option number three and four are do the opposite. In other words, put, put the bonds on purpose into your taxable accounts. And they, there again, it's to, there's the do it all at once right now, or do it more gradually over time. So you might be saying, why in the, what, Eric, you just made this argument for putting <laughs> the tax efficient things into taxable accounts. Why would anyone even entertain the idea of putting the tax, the, the tax inefficient things into a taxable account? And the answer is, and it's rare, but the answer is, is that if over time you have essentially consumed all of your IRAs and all you have left now are taxable accounts and Roth IRA accounts, oh my, load up your fast growing things in the Roth. <laughs> and that will by default mean that you will have those, those slow and tax inefficient bonds in your taxable account. But even there, it may, I'm not saying it will, it may work out better for you. And analysis of the kind that we're doing, you know, here is, is what will help you determine which of those four approaches is the most sensible. So just to recap, do nothing or do something. And if you do something, put the, put the tax efficient things into your taxable accounts or and the tax inefficient things into your IRAs and Roth and either do it all right now or stretch it out. And options four and five are just flip those last two and the logic of those on their heads and put the, the bonds uh, into your taxable account and do it all at once or do it gradually over time. And Eric, Got it. And Eric, I just want to uh, exp help uh, explain a little bit further. Situa situation three and four, mm -hmm. when it says put the bonds in the taxable and you know do it now versus yep. do it gradually. You had says that you had said that yes. assumes your IR your traditional IRAs are exhausted. By that you meant those either don't exist or have been converted to a Roth. Correct. Either they've been converted, or they were in converted either they were converted entirely or they were converted partially and then after they were converted partially then you lived off them for a while and and now they're then gone. they disappeared yeah, you spent you spent mm -hmm. them. so uh, i just bring that point up because it's we're not saying hey we want these interest bearing things in a taxable account we're saying of the limited options we have, which is it's either taxable or Roth, taxable is where it's going in this in this example. Right. And what we'll see is that at least in the cases that we looked at and the other cases that we've we've looked at over time with other clients, the, those last those last options are almost never the recommended ones, but they they do sometimes surface and it might be for you. And so we just don't want to pretend they don't exist. All right. So now I think the next question is, to, the, or the next uh, sort of insight to share with our clients is, well, how much of a difference can this measure or taking the right measure here versus taking the absolute wrong measure here, how much can it add 
to the value of your portfolio. Are you guys ready for that topic or do you want to weigh in on some of the things we've talked about no. so far? Adrian, please, if you've got yeah, some. We can, uh, yeah, we can uh, move on to that topic. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of the listeners are going to kind of put themselves and see what, what case will be best for me. And Eric, if you can kind of go, what, what are going to be some of like the main data points um, that people can look at that shows, all right, this might be the best position for me. I know everyone's situation is a little bit different, but what are you think kind of like the biggest data point where, all right, this is where this case is going to lean more to you. This is the case that you maybe should stay away from the most. Sure. Well, let's do that then. So here's what I'm going to do. So for our YouTube um, audience, you'll be able, we think, we'll be able to see this. We've adopted a new recording software in the last month that we hope will give everyone, both our podcast listeners and you, our YouTube audience, a better experience. But to our podcast audience, we're going to do our level best here to pretend that you can't, that, that we're not even showing these and we're just going to hopefully allow um, our language that so you can listen to to convey precisely uh, and fully what it is uh, that we found when we did this. All right, so I'm going to share my screen here and uh, let's uh, bring up this. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to start with the, the case that we will probably end with, which is the case that we had used a couple uh, podcast episodes back Actually, where we got into Eric, a big argument. Can about, I interrupt? Yes. Can we do this one last if you don't mind? All right. Just because I think okay, it'll, we certainly it'll, can. Go, it'll go well. Thank you. Okay, sure. All right. So what I want to do is then in this particular case, I don't want to get into a ton of the detail, but what I do want to just say is what is this particular client doing? So this particular client, um, the recommended strategy for this client is to convert uh, the their IRAs for uh, the current calendar year up through and including 2028 and do so up to the top of their 22% marginal income tax bracket. We talked about that concept in at length a couple episodes ago and uh, actually, well, well, we can find the, the episode and put the precise episode and a link to that episode in our show notes. But in, in any case, for the next um, essentially eight years, this year, 2021 included, they would convert, or no, actually this is starting in 2022, they would convert about half of the money that's in their um, IRAs into Roth IRAs. And so that would be done, you know, gently, relatively gently. And then starting in 2029, they would use the mix that they've arrived at by that time in, in both still the sum of the money remaining in their IRA, some of the money in the Roth, and, and uh, also some money in their taxable accounts and mix that to push the taxable income to the top of the 12% bracket. And once that's gone, then they would switch over to Roth money only. Well, in this case, the ending result by using the best of these tax location strategies against the worst of these tax location strategies. Remember, all the other stuff is baked in. When they take Social Security, the Roth conversions, the withdrawal strategies, all that's already assumed to be true. This is only the additional benefit attributable to the use of this tax location option. What happens here is, is that the difference between the best and the worst is a 43% improvement in the final value of their portfolio. And so in most people would say, wow, if I can move the needle by, in their case, roughly $100,000 by doing this right, I, I would want to do that. And what's interesting in this case is that the, the worst option for this client actually is the one that we would normally find is the best, namely putting, putting the money into the tax deferred accounts and doing it on a gradual basis. That's the worst approach that they could follow. In this client's case, and this is a, is this is a more rare outcome, they would be advised to right away, switch the portfolio around and locate the taxable, th the, 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 the 
high the tax inefficient bonds in their taxable account and let the other things uh, let the other things run. So questions or observations about that, guys? No, I, I what I expected from this one was that there would be an improvement, right? And that that's where that's where mm-hmm. I um, I'm seeing that improvement there, which which is along the lines. Now that best minus worst about that forty three percent difference that mm-hmm. is huge. I didn't expect it to be that big. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wasn't expecting that either. And particularly, I wasn't expecting it with the worst being, you know, one of those that we normally find to be advisable. Mm-hmm. So having now pointed that out, what if maybe it's a fairer comparison? Some might ask, some of our listeners might ask, well, yeah, okay, best, you're, you're cherry picking the best versus the, the worst. What about the best of the options here versus just doing nothing? Yeah. All right. Well, in this case, it, it's not substantial, but it's still, I would say it's still noteworthy is that it leaves them $30,000 better off given their starting point or said differently as an ending portfolio value, it increases the ending portfolio value by almost 11%. Yeah, and, uh, you so know, some people may say, well, I'm not going to get nitpicky about $30,000. No, you probably want to be a little nitpicky about $30,000 if based on your spending, and in this client's case, it's the spending that's a little bit of an issue. It, it's the, you know, if your spending is such that you're sort of targeting a, a portfolio burnout at the end, then you probably you probably should say, if I can increase its its final value at, by 11%, that means that if I live a little, little bit longer than I'm expecting, I'll still have a little more money left. Well, I mean, and Eric, uh, even, that's the even issue. Even further, uh, I, I know you can relate because you and I tend to be pretty frugal in general, but who wants to just mm-hmm. waste 30 grand? Like we're not, we're, we're yeah. not talking about wasting $30,000 and that you have to do something major and life changing. Like you, you you don't have to give an organ up for the $30,000. All you've got to do is pay attention to where your money is allocated and where you would draw it from. Uh-huh. Right. That, that, that's, that's it. You're, yeah. you're just moving around the pieces of the puzzle a little bit, so to speak, as opposed to something that is, you know, painful uh, to do. So to, to, to me, yes, there's no yeah, pain. I, but <laughs> let, let's continue on. Let's continue on to the next, the next scenario, the next client's case. All right. So in this case, the the approach here is and Eric. Can we for, uh, the, for the, this one? Let me. Do you mind if I just ask a couple questions on this? Go so ahead. I, to me, there are two important factors, or I guess maybe three. I'll start with the first one. One is there an improvement by doing the tax allocation versus leaving their portfolio as it is? Yes, in their case, the if versus the approach of just having identical allocations in each of their tax buckets. Um, there is a three in now these clients start with a bigger, a bigger nut, but it, they'll be at the end of the day, if this projects $356,000 better off if they use the tax location, tax allocation strategy that's, that's deemed to be by this optimal rather than just going, ah, it doesn't matter. So there, there is an improvement here by making some adjustment. And then my second question is, uh, is the adjustment that's optimal for them the same as the previous uh, uh, analysis? No. In fact, in this one, it is uh, to move the interest-bearing holdings, again, that's another, that's code for the bonds for the most part, move the bonds into the Roth and IRAs in in this case and do it right now. Don't dilly dally. Now, bear in mind that as as a backdrop to all of this for 2021, two, three, and four, they're doing Roth conversions they're converting almost a million dollars of their IRAs into Roth IRAs. And they're doing that up to the top of what is now the 24% tax bracket. Then starting in 2025, they shift to a strategy. Now that they've built up this war chest of Roth money, tax-free money, 
then after that point, they would aim to keep their tax bracket in the 10% tax bracket. So that's pretty solid. And as a result, the in this case, the best versus the worst is a $1.4 million swing, or given their base of uh, the ending anticipated ending balance of their portfolio, nearly a 12% better result than just uh, than doing it the wrong way. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, that answers my questions on this. Unless, uh, uh, Adrian, you have any questions on this, I'm going to ask you the same two that I had for the next scenario. Okay. All right, let's go to the next scenario. So same question. First and is, is there an improvement? And then instead of asking if it's different, because the last two are different, my answer, my question will be, is there an improvement? And what is the optimal scenario for this couple or this case? Yes, well, in this, in this particular case, using the optimal approach, which is the same as the second scenario, right now, reposition that portfolio in such a way that you get those bonds out of your taxable accounts and 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 put more tax efficient things into your taxable accounts in this particular client's case um, doing that versus doing nothing leads to about half a million dollars of being half a million dollars better off at the end of the day or close to five percent better off with the ending value of their portfolio and versus doing it the worst way it, they are about seven and a half percent better off or three quarters of a million dollars better off if they if they go about it in that way yeah so we are definitely seeing an improvement this is similar to our the second case but different from the first the first was the one that was a little bit of a surprise for mm -hmm, us, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so let, let's yep. go on to the next one that, that we've got. All right. The next case, answering your two questions again, in this case, the best approach for this client, actually, surprisingly, is to do no tax allocation. In other words, do have identical allocations in each of the accounts, which is, which is surprising. But uh, at first glance, but the reason is is that these these clients are such um, they their tendency to spend is so out of alignment with the resources that they have to support it that they are going to uh, um, based on their life expectancies roughly ten or fifteen years in advance of their passing essentially burn through all of their money. And that what they'll have left to live on at that point is going to be it's going to be a painful adjustment, but they'll be living on just their pensions and Social Security. So um, not great, but it, it, it's it's showing the consequence of saying, I'm just going to I'm just going to go pedal to the metal on my spending. So in this case, some of those other shifts would be disruptive. That said, the second best approach right behind that is our old favorite right now get the taxable things out uh, or the the interest bearing things out of your taxable accounts and uh that's the second best so um in this case the 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 swing is not as great you know it's maybe mm, i don't know it's maybe a two percent move uh that way but at least it's it's something and yeah and i definitely find this case um, the, the most interesting, because I remember in the previous episode, uh, Roshan, you mentioned, um, should should everybody be considering tax allocation? And you say, um, if you pay taxes, you should be doing something like this. And then we have a case here where not doing tax allocation at all is the best situation for this uh, client in this case. And Eric, you said this is due more to spending habits. Well, is that correct? Hold on, I, I need to respond to what you said. For I stand by my statement: if you're paying taxes, you need to do something. But Adrian, what this illustrates is that you run the analysis, and maybe you don't change what you're doing. So I stand by my statement okay. of: if you're paying taxes, I think you should analyze your situation to see should you be doing something. Most cases, it will say you probably should. But we do have outliers like this, and I don't think um, in uh, in this specific case, 
uh, especially when you're spending and you're running out of money, I would double down on my you should do something because if you're going to run out of money, any marginal increase you can have is huge. Right. So I think they more than anyone else need to spend the time to actually review the scenario and see if they need to make an adjustment. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I'll support that because the second best strategy here is, is, is as I said, the do, do this now. Get right now, get your interest bearing things out of your taxable accounts. So make do the tax allocation. And it's just a few, you know, doll, it's like $7,000 in terms of lifetime value uh, behind the best strategy on a lifetime um, lifetime wealth and lifetime income from Social Security and pensions of $3.8 million. So to be $7,000 behind on that is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty darn close. So, and what I would say coupled with that, though, in this case is, yes, do that, but also we have got to change your spending. Yeah. So you just can't do that anymore. And and I bet you dollars to donuts that the minute we do that, what's going to happen is, is that our, our old favorite is going to rise to the leader, the top of the leaderboards here. Well, and Eric, one other thing with their spending habits, mm -hmm. they will change. It's either they're going to choose to do it or they're going to be forced to live on Social Security. So true. Correct. So it's, do you want to do yes. it in advance on your terms or do you want to be forced to do it later? Mm -hmm. Well, well put. All right. And then the final case is, is uh, the scenario of this client that we had used uh, as our hypothetical client um, a, a few weeks back. And again, we'll get the precise episode uh, number and the link to that episode in the show notes so that you can go back and review it. But we discussed at length um, a client and Roshan, do you want to just give us a refresher on the particulars of her scenario? Yeah, so this was a, a, a client that we uh, uh, crafted, but it was based on a client I was working with where she's retired. She wanted to um, uh, she was going to wanted to start her Social Security at the full retirement age. So we had talked about delaying it would actually be a little bit more optimal. What's an interesting update on that is I spoke to her recently and she is now more open to the idea, which she wasn't before. So that shows. Oh, postponing social yeah, security. And, and that shows the value of it's similar to that. This is actually a different client from the one I mentioned earlier that was going to take it at 62. And for years I was getting her mm -hmm. to push it back. Well, um, yeah. what, what changed for this client is now that she has retired and we actually started up uh, her monthly income from her IRA, getting uh, that monthly check from her IRA has made her comfortable with seeing that income's coming in. So now she's open to delaying Social Security, which is an interesting twist and I guess shows the value of just um, constantly discussing these things because it was it was an optimal scenario. But that's our update. Let me get back to your question of of the refresher. So this was a client that had money in a taxable account and uh, a Roth IRA and a traditional IRA. She was retiring. And what made her situation so interesting is she was going to stay below the 12% bracket. And that's where Eric and I started having a debate on whether it makes sense to uh, to do the conversion. And, uh, and um, uh, we had a little bit of an argument there. So this is just bringing us back to it going from us having the, the discussion about it and using calculators and spreadsheets we created. We've now, Eric has now put it into the software to come up with the software analysis. So Eric, give us the update from the software. All right. So just, uh, and I think the amounts here are relevant to, as well. So she had $700,000 of investable assets, 400 of which were in IRAs, 200 of which were in taxable accounts, 100 of which were in Roth IRAs. We just did that simplified uh, analysis and said she's 67. And in this case, I assumed for this analysis that she would live till 90, which was closer to her, as you pointed out earlier, closer to her uh, her actuarial yeah. table life expectancy. So in this case, in this case, we found, as you might remember from my mentioning it, um, last week when we resolved this, uh, or at least we visited for about 30 seconds, is that uh, the 
the analysis showed something that neither of us expected. And that was that rather than doing any Roth IRA conversions at all, what this one said she ought to do is burn through that $100,000 of Roth IRA money up front and then use a combination of her two remaining pools of wealth, namely the IRA at $400,000 and the taxable account at $200,000. And until three years later, she started Social Security. Then in that period, and for that matter, for the rest of her life, she ought to keep her tax brackets, manage, manage her tax, uh, taxable income such that she didn't exceed the top of her 10%, not her 12, but the top of her 10% marginal income tax bracket. I was not expecting that. No. And uh, so, you know, very interesting how, given the particular facts of that case, um, there was this there was this unexpected outcome, hence the value of doing actual analysis and not just using a rule of thumb. Yeah, and, uh, but uh, what stood out for me, actually, I think it's very important to note in this specific client's case, part of what drives this is she has kept her expenses low. She has no liabilities at all. Uh, and so she, her low expense level allows her to stay in these lower tax brackets, right? So as important mm -hmm. as knowing what the asset levels were, I think it's, it's worth noting that um, her expenses can almost but not fully be covered by Social Security. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, so now the, the question is, is there any further advantage for this client by, but to go one step further and do the, the tax location um, uh, adjustments? Well, the answer is, is that against measured against the do nothing strategy, there's not much of an improvement, maybe about a 1% improvement in the final value of her portfolio. And in this case, we're talking about four thousand dollars of improvement i i don't know um you, i i would say probably doesn't hurt it's 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 not a it's not like if you ask your advisor to allocate your assets at the household level that it's gonna just cost you lots of nights of lost sleep and if it's gonna improve your scenario by four thousand i guess it's one additional way to just get a little edge remember lots of other edges were already obtained in the delaying of social security the withdrawal strategy, et cetera. But in this particular case, um, it, it's a minor improvement. But here's what's also noteworthy. If she said, well, I think I, I think what I want to do is, you know, go about it in the following way. I'm going to put my bonds in my taxable account and I'm going to do that because I want, you know, for whatever reason she might arrive at, uh, I, I want to be able to access that money and, that, and so I want to have the, the money that's in my taxable accounts, which I'm more prone to use for these sorts of these sorts of discretionary expenses or emergencies. I want that to be, you know, the more stable stuff, namely the bonds. The difference between the properly tax allocated or the, the, the let me restate that. In this case, the analytically optimal approach versus that approach. That's a huge difference, actually. It's a 17 percent difference in the ending value of her portfolio uh, as a result of doing that. So I would say, I, I would say even for this client, after all the other optimizations have been made, going one step further with this really is worthwhile. Yeah, and what's, what, uh, what's interesting about this, remember, um, we typically would expect the interest bearing or the bonds to go in a tax deferred account, like an IRA, a traditional IRA, right? Because we normally want con the conventional wisdom. Typically what we expect is bonds all get filled up in the traditional IRA. You want the growth in the Roth and you want the tax efficient growth, the long-term capital gains and dividends in the taxable account. But that was different in her case, right? And this, this outcome, that's not what the, optimize, uh, the software optimized, correct? Not quite. It does still put the bonds into her IRA. And and remember, she doesn't have any Roth IRA money left after a couple of years. She's spending that. First, so yes. she spends that spends through that in a hurry. And so as a result, it is that the bonds are in the IRAs and the and the tax efficient things are in her taxable account. Mm -hmm. 
But with that, um, with that, she, it, her approach isn't to do it. Let's do it all at once. In her case, it is to do it a little bit more gradually because she's trying to manage that tax bracket uh, and, and keep it at the 10% or lower level after, uh, you know, f throughout her lifetime. Yeah, the surprise was that spend the Roth first, just because I've never seen that before. Yeah. Right. right. We had been exactly. discussing and what we were arguing was whether she should convert. And I think I think we both actually, before running the analysis, thought it made sense to convert up to the 12 percent. And yes. uh, whether to convert at a greater percent is where we differed. What was just interesting is the software mm -hmm. said, no, not only don't convert, but spend all that money down. And I'd never seen this before. I'll tell you, for me, the overall um, uh, theme or really the bottom line, excuse me, of this specific episode is that uh, I always say do the homework and do the analysis. This one more so than any, uh, I think it stands out just because we've got five different scenarios and uh, two of the five had a similar outcome in terms of what the result said to do, but the other three were totally mm -hmm. different. And um, uh, a lot of them were not what we expected at all. Yeah, the five client cases. Correct. Yeah, it, it is. It, it really does illustrate that there isn't a one size fits yeah. all. Answer. Yeah, very much so. So, Eric, continue with this one. You made a heat map with your analysis of this case. So, <laughs> yes. so this is the software saying spend it down. Eric, then uh, Eric and I sort of traded spreadsheets. I created mine on on the fly and just <laughs> made people wait while I was doing it while recording. Eric, after the, <laughs> the uh, episode went and made his. His is by far more complicated than mine. Uh, so uh, <laughs> mine is just numbers. We've got Eric's that he's going to share for those of you watching on YouTube. Okay. Well, this is, this is I think, a little bit of the, sort of like the male ego wanting to be <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, or maybe it's the first board wanting to be right. I don't know exactly, but... Uh, so I put in a little time on this particular spreadsheet. So the um, the basic argument that we had in that episode, and this was now three weeks ago, as I recall, or three episodes ago, was does it make sense for this the same client that we were just talking about to do Roth conversions? And if so, would it make sense for her to actually push her Roth IRA conversions past the 12% level, even up to the 22% level. Now you might be saying, why are we even having this conversation? Didn't you just say that not only was she not supposed to do any Roth IRA conversions, she was supposed to burn through the Roth money first. Why are we having this conversation? Well, I'll give you an answer. The answer is, is that coming very close in second place for that clan was to do Roth IRA conversions, and it was to do them to the the top of, I believe, the 10% bracket. So she would do that gently and convert a wee little bit and, uh, into Roth IRA. And once again, noting that that was different than what we expected, right? We we had both yes. thought up to 12 probably made sense, but and beyond that is where we differed. Well, this is saying... Mm -hmm. You guys were both wrong. Going up to 12 is not a good idea. Only go up to 10. And that was the second best answer behind spend down all your Roth money. Right. So, but this, what this argument is, is you could call this sort of like chapter two of today's, of today's discussion, because what this is looking at really is more the question of rather than using the, the five simple choices that we gave in up until now in this episode about the tax allocation options, namely do nothing or get the bonds out of the taxable accounts and do it either suddenly or do it gradually, or no, wedge all the bonds into the taxable accounts and do it either suddenly or do it gradually. This is a somewhat more nuanced approach on this particular spreadsheet. The, the nuance here is to say, that it's that if we look at the expected returns to more than just a two asset world, 
stocks and bonds, but we really think about it as maybe 10 or 15 different uh, kinds of things that you can have in your portfolio. There are going to be some of those that at any given time have a lower expected return and a middling expected return and a higher expected return. So this analysis assumes that we have the choice, not only as we've talked about so far in this podcast to push the taxable or pardon me, the, the, the interest bearing bonds into the IRA or, or so forth. But this gives us this spreadsheet gives us the additional opportunity to take the fastest growing things of all the, all the other things that are available to us and put those specifically into the Roth IRA. And so I looked in and at uh, the various asset class expectations right now that Morningstar has been um, forecasting for the next 20 years. And I took the two or three of those that were the fastest growing and I put those explicitly into the Roth and then the rest uh, balanced them out between the taxable accounts and the IRAs and, and shooting for a relatively modest overall return to the portfolio. So this, this client, by the way, doing what I've just described, if this client is someone who doesn't look at their portfolio as the entire household, but picks up the account statement for the Roth and then picks up the account statement for the IRA, then picks up the account statement for the taxable account, uh, depending on what the markets have done more recently, is going to either be ecstatic about the Roth or, or deeply dismayed about the Roth. <laughs> and they're going to be thinking, why, why is my IRA growing so slowly, et cetera, et cetera. There's going to be lots of reactions to it. So the answer, if, if you do this, clients, you need to really look at your portfolio across the household and understand that the, the strategy involves di mo different moving parts, differently moving parts in each of these accounts. Okay, so, so there's the context, there's the backdrop. So what I looked at was, would it make sense for this client, if she used what we'll call this supercharged Roth IRA, as well as the decision to house more of the bonds in her portfolio into her IRA, her traditional IRA, would it be advantageous for her to cough up the tax money necessary to do the Roth IRA conversion up to that 22% level, even though, as Roshan pointed out vigorously in our episode three, three times in a row, Eric, that's stupid. <laughs> well, I hope. I think you. Is, I think you actually did say stupid. Well, my, my argument. It, I don't know that I said that, but if I did, I stand by it. <laughs> I, th I good, think that was nice. Good. But my whole argument was: Why would you pay tax at a rate you'll never have to pay tax at? Right. She she would Correct. never pay twenty two percent because of her expense level. So why pay an extra uh, tax now that you would never have to pay in the future? Correct. Perfectly reasonable thing. So what I did is you built using certain assumptions about the, her uh, our targeted growth rate, her targeted spending, her targeted cost of living adjustments that she would need in her portfolio and, and the amounts of uh, conversions that she would do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I looked at whether it would make sense for her to do a sequence of Roth IRA conversions year by year and and what that led to was the following um, result that probably, probably if she was really trying to nail it down and optimize the size of her portfolio at the end of her life, she would actually do Roth IRA conversions to the top of the 22% uh, marginal income tax bracket for the first five years. But that's, that's for a super optimizer. What what I found was if you were to say, well, what about a prudent, what about a prudent optimizer who's who's weighing some of the trade-offs a little bit more carefully and isn't concerned only with the final, final result if she lives a long, long time? In this case, my counsel to this client uh, might be do a Roth IRA conversion 
for one year and one year only up to that 22% bracket, and then don't do any more Roth IRA conversions after that, because here, here's what would happen. It would cost her out of her taxable account. Remember, if she does a $40,000 conversion in year one, do the math, my our listeners, $40,000 times 22% is $8,800 that she would have to spend out of her taxable account to cover the cost of that conversion. Now, that what I found was that if she did that for one year and one year only, the net effect of that would be for the first 25 years or so that she's just flat out seven or eight thousand dollars worse off. She it's it takes a long, long time in this case for her to 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 feel like, man, I'm better off doing it that way. And but but starting in or roughly around the year 28, 29 she is better off. And in fact, if she were to live into her late 90s or early 100s, and I, I don't know that that's likely, but I would say, but I think it's not, it's, it can't be ruled out. In this case, if she did it for that one year, the value of her total assets at that time would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40% greater by by having once upon a time made that $8,800 spend to do one year of Roth IRA conversion. Now, here's my, here's my argument. Roshan, actually, let me have Roshan make his argument about why that's a terrible idea. I mean, how old is she now? 67. So you're telling me she is worse off until she is 28 years down the road? Mm -hmm. So you're telling me she is worse off until 95. What's the likelihood of her living to 95? You actually, yeah, what, what, what actually you, your own analysis, you said she's living to 90. <laughs> I, I did in this, I, I did in terms of the other it's plan the where client. we tried to arrive at what's the optimal withdrawal strategy and Roth conversion strategy. But this is asking the question, what if she does live longer? No, well, no, not, not necessarily. You, I, now we both have talked about this before. I use age 100 because when I'm doing a plan, because I'm more comfortable than it, you mm -hmm. run an actuarial table uh -huh. based on the client's health. And then you, you, you get a target age. Yeah. So, uh, in this case, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, attacking both of our methodologies because you're saying she's <laughs> living five years longer than you would assume. And I'm saying, well, the odds of her getting there are lower, right? Right. The odds of her getting to 95 are, are, are low. So yeah, I don't, I, I stand by my statement of last time where this makes no sense to me at all. Good. And that's, I love that because otherwise we would, we would, if you had suddenly changed your mind, we wouldn't have the necessary level of controversy to make this an interesting <laughs> episode. So here we go. So I would say if I used Roshan's age 100 assumption mm -hmm. about his, his planning outcomes, this client is uh, 280 Three thousand, we'll say, better off. Two hundred and eighty-three thousand dollars better off at age one hundred by having spent eight thousand eight hundred dollars at age sixty-seven. Well, well, let's put some context conversion. around this age one hundred before you uh, start mm -hmm. going down that path. Mm -hmm. I use age one hundred right. because I want to make sure the client doesn't run out of money, and I don't think uh -huh. the likelihood of my average. I, I I actually don't have a client that's made it to one hundred yet. Right. So the likelihood of okay. someone actually making it to 100, I think, is is pretty low. I think the, the and if I uh -huh. remember an old uh, data point correctly, in a couple, there's a 25 percent chance that one of them makes it to 95. Right. Uh -huh. Not even 100. So, though, I stand by using 100 in my analysis and I'll still do that. That to me is a margin uh -huh. of safety so that you don't run out. The client doesn't run out of money. I don't actually think all my clients uh, okay. are going to live to 100, which is why I think your analysis okay, is flawed. Okay, that's I think, fair. and let, let so me here's flip, what, flip it and say it one yeah. other one other way, right? In your analysis, sure. the client is better off at age 95 or beyond. Correct. Um, I would say, yeah, I would say probably actually even probably more like age 96. And okay. Beyond. So 96 and beyond. So you're, you're making my case even stronger. So in your, in your analysis, the client is better off at age 96 and beyond the likelihood of them making it to 96 is low. 
we forget knowing the percentage. It's it's uh, single digits, less than twenty percent, whatever the number is. There's a, let's just say it's twenty percent, and I'm I'm giving you extra credit for that because I don't think the actual number is twenty. Oh, I don't want twenty percent. I'll take five. Okay, so there's a five percent chance the client lives beyond ninety five. So there's a ninety five percent chance you wasted eight thousand of their dollars. No, I'm going to make it even harder than that. I'm going to say there's a five percent chance. There's a five, there's maybe a five percent chance that she lives till ninety or past. Okay. So so I'm going to say that ninety five percent likelihood she will die, roughly seven or eight thousand dollars worse off. Ninety five percent chance that she'll die seven or eight thousand dollars worse and, off. Because and your ego in is this fragile case, enough. I stupidly. Your ego is so fragile. You need to defend this argument when everything you're saying says it's a bad move. <laughs> no, it doesn't, because because in the in the range of in the five percent range, in that five percent likelihood, the the swing in her favor is so uh, magnificent that on a and this Dude, is she's my dead. dear clients who love math, you'll certainly understand this. It, Roshan apparently wants to be obtuse <laughs> about this, but those of my clients who, uh, those of my, our listeners who understand the mathematics of expected expectations, so you multiply the probability of one outcome times the payoff to that outcome, and then the probability of another outcome times the payoff to that outcome to find the expected return to a decision. And in this case, if there's a ninety-five percent likelihood that she loses. $8,000, but there's a 5% probability that she picks up, let's say $300,000. Then the, the math of that says, you know what? It's an advantageous move for her, for her to do that. It's a, it's a good decision for her to do I'm not, that. I see, now, I'm not being obtuse. I think you're mm -hmm. taking the mathematics too far. I'm going to give you another, another okay. example, right? Eric, how much money is she better off? 300 grand? It, it depends on the age, but I'm just using 300 as an approximation. Okay. So let's say, so, so you know, Eric, sometimes higher, it's sometimes lower. I'm going to walk you over to the Golden Gate Bridge. And I'm going to tell you, yeah. Eric, you jump off this bridge right now. If you survive, uh -huh. I'll give you 300 grand. You jumping? No, because no, the, no, the, the odds of survival is much off lower of, than 5%. No, the odds of surviving off of uh, jumping off a bridge is about 2%. To me, that's close enough to 5 Right. So okay. if you, so hold on. So if I take you to a bridge and say, Eric, jump off this bridge right now, if you survive, I will give you 300,000. You would jump. Um, it, it, well, it, the, the absurd, it's an absurd example because it's, it's the as absurd as yours. Payoff is you losing your life, which is a little worse. I'm going to say than seven or eight thousand dollars in my case. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you don't value your life that much, but I'm going to say it's, it's worth a little more than eight grand. So the negative payoff, the ni the ninety eight percent negative payoff. It's not just the probability; it's the payoff. You'd have to say, Eric, that uh, you know something crash your junk or car. Ninety percent, ninety five percent likelihood that you'll cr you'll crash your junk or car and it'll be total, or you know a five percent payoff that you'll be handed a check for three hundred thousand dollars. Would you do it? I'd say, well, math says I should. So yeah, let's go for it. But anyway, this my my point about this is mostly uh, I'm doing this for for the humor and fun value yeah. of a little bit of the argument, but that's really not my main interest in this particular um, analysis. My main interest in this analysis is you know because this is one isolated client example, and and really if you look at this across a much wider array of client samples, the question is is does it make sense? Does it make sense to to if you can supercharge your Roth IRA, does it ever make sense to do Roth IRA conversions at a tax rate higher than you were likely to incur during your retirement years? And I think the answer is, is that yes, it is. And we could look and I can show you other client scenarios. I just elected to use the client that we had been debating so vigorously in our th three episodes ago. To, to use as the base case for this analysis, but I've done this same sort of thing with other clients. And it's it's fairly consistent that at some point, the, the cost factor is overcome. And then they start getting into, you know, really green pastures as a result of doing that. It's not, it's not you don't want to go crazy with it, but you certainly, you certainly want, 
you know, you certainly want to look on a case by case basis, whether indeed it makes sense. And for that matter, Roshan, just coming back to the five cases that we looked at earlier in this episode, remember that in some of those cases, they were saying, convert to the 22 and the 24% level. And then after that, the rest of your life, you'll never be out of the 10 or 12% bracket. Uh, yeah. So even, even that methodology is showing that based on, you know, depending on the client circumstance, life expectancy, composition of their assets, risk tolerance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the optimal strategy indeed can be uh, Roth conversions um, with a tax allocation right, but don't, don't, uh, component. Added don't forget in. to mention the reason they are in that lower tax scenario in, in those other, those other scenarios, the reason they're in the lower tax bracket is because they did the conversions. Had they not done the conversions, Correct. they would have been in a higher bracket. Well, that, that is, that is true. Case, in that this is true. Case, that's not accurate mm-hmm. though, right? That's what makes it different. I'm not saying don't ever convert well, at a higher bracket. What I'm saying is in her case, it didn't make sense to me to put her in a bracket she would never enter. And the other thing I think is worth noting using your chart and your math is, yes, she's eight grand in the hole at the beginning, but until age uh, 90, 95, she is then almost 16 grand in the hole. And that $300,000 improvement is only at age 100. Right. You're, you're, well, we've already been your improvement. I'm not negating what you're saying, but we've already been through that point And it has you have to come back to the probability. No, I don't think What's you do, more, though. I think you're taking this probability. What I think where I think your flaw is, is you're, you're uh, saying the math is law. And all I think the math no. is used for is to is to have you think about it. And, and the part I think you're missing in this scenario is that, yeah, so what? The math says you could be positive, but she's not going to live that long. Let, let's be let's okay. be honest. Well, that's, the likely, that, you and I don't think she is actually going to live beyond 95. Forget the math for a moment. Just what do you know? Do you think the average 67 year old will make it to 95? The average will certainly okay. not. No. So more than likely, some, she some will. Even though, even though the math says something, that's where I think I think we differ on this scenario. I mean, if you really want to make this a home run, have her live till 500 years old, and she'll be tens of millions ahead. To me, that's as ridiculous right. a comparison. It, which you're, which, but the application of your logic, I, I really do think this is a little bit of a sideshow, and I've said that before, so I'm gonna, I'll, yes. I'll, but I'll engage with you because you are engaging on this subject. The 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 question here is, is the way that you are arguing this, Roshan, could also be applied to the question of when you take Social Security. Because do you think that the average sixty five year old, you, you know, coming back to this, this average sixty seven year old is going to live till age ninety? Um, then in that case, what you ought to do when you do your social security optimizations is if that's your argument is you ought to plot in average life expectancy for 67 year olds to arrive at your assumptions about the optimal social security withdrawal strategy. And I, I bet do look, if you did I that, do look at you would it find break even what I, what I look at. So I, I don't take the average age, but if I'm doing a social security comparison and you've got someone taking it at 67 versus 70, if that break even for them is age 95. I'm digging deeper and 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 uh, and not leaning towards going that route. But if that break even mm-hmm. for them is like 80, then yes, it seems to make sense. Well, all right. So the other thing I'm going to say in response to your point about the case of those uh, five scenarios that we looked at earlier in this podcast, where as a result of uh, doing conversions up to the 22 or 24. I, I don't, I can't remember exactly where it stopped, but as a result of doing those conversions at a higher eventual tax, uh, at a higher current tax bracket, then they would eventually incur partly because of the conversions. I want to emphasize, I made this test with this client even harder by not awarding her a lower tax bracket in the future due to the the Roth IRA conversion. Hold on, she's so not going to be in a lower bracket because of the Roth conversion because she might be in a ten. I, she might be in no, a ten. No, based she's on already conversions. in a ten. Remember, she's already We're in not, ten because well, I use twelve. So so you so I use twelve punished her her entire life at a twelve percent tax bracket, which so, makes your argument stronger. So in that case, no. Why not? My argument would be stronger if I went to ten because in the future the benefit of having had more money in her Roth and less in her taxable account and less in her IRAs would be, would be deeply rewarded by being in a lower, in a 10% tax bracket. I don't think it's going to be, well, first of all, I don't think it'd be the two, 2% will make a difference. Agreed. I don't think it'll be that, that significant. 
And uh, though you penalize her initially at the conversion point, which, as you said, is only 8,000, she is then getting a benefit in the future because this millions and millions of growth you're getting her by the time she's 150 years old is now taxed at, uh, is now not being taxed versus the 12% bracket for everything else. Well, anyhow, <laughs> great, great uh, that we had a chance to dig into this. And if um, anyone is so still listening, I think the they, bottom line they for our, hate us both right now. This, oh no, I think actually uh, the, the, we probably had a few listeners say I've had enough, yes. and I appreciate those of you of our listeners who have said I'm sticking with this. This is fun, but the, what the point of this is not really about fun. I think it, even if you take Roshan's point and you take my or you take my point, whether which of those whichever of those viewpoints you you um, think makes the more sense, the greater makes more sense here. I think what you also can discover in this is, is that not all financial planners are going to agree, even when they're you know, looking at the math of it, about what the optimal course is. So there is indeed, in addition to all of the value that we've talked about in episode after episode about using a rigorous analysis, there is also the judgment element. And, you know, so it, just know that if you hear if you hear a recommendation from an advisor, it's not necessarily then you should interpret that, even if it's well reasoned and and it's well um, it's well analyzed using the advanced tools and you know the sophisticated software that we have. There's still a judgment element, and so you know taking it necessarily as gospel without probing and exploring why that recommendation is being issued is probably well. Let me put that restate that in the reverse. Even the recommendations that you're given, I think I'd just encourage you strongly to ask your advisor to explain how they arrived at that and what what are the what are the other options. And you might say, Eric, what an idiotic recommendation. I'm going with Roshan's approach. But I think you'll probably say the opposite. Yeah, I still disagree with that. But but I with the point that you just made, I fully agree with. Yeah, I from when I've started, they've always said I think I remember my managers and so on saying that. Uh, financial plan. They used to say financial planning is an art, not a science. I would actually change that yeah. to say, I think financial planning is an art, but it tries to use science. Uh, and I, I mean that in a uh -huh. positive, not a negative way, because we've got all these tools. Uh -huh. We try to, uh, to bring a scientific aspect to it. But at the end of the day, there's so many assumptions, you just can't. Right. So, yes. so you try yes, your best, that is so true. whatever it is. And Eric, though you and I disagree in that uh, significantly, if I'm right, she is at worst, uh, based on your chart at age, whatever, 95, at worst, she's $15,000 worse off. It does not impact her retirement at all. She has enough to live. She's passing money to her heirs. There's really no negative impact to that. On the flip side, if I'm wrong and she's better off and I'm just going to take the next year, she's $45,000 better off, which is more money for her heirs. Uh, and uh, they're happier. But once again, neither decision caused any kind of major change in her life. And I think that's important because she can then feel comfortable making the decision. We present, I, I always like to say that actually to people too. We try to present all the information to you to make the decision you're most comfortable with. And yeah. so we well, can argue with for hours ahead, on this that. and we, we don't have to agree as long <laughs> as she's okay in the end. That's all that matters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, listen, this has got to be one of our longest episodes on record. I think we're at a min an hour and 15 minutes. So listeners, if you stayed with us to this point, you, you deserve a, a badge of some kind. <laughs> yes. So to a, a couple listeners that I, I know that give me feedback on the episode, Lisa and Neil, if you are still here, thank you very much for your continued support. <laughs> I would say hi to my mom or my wife, but they don't listen to any of the episodes. <laughs> uh, Adrian, Eric, do you have anything that you'd like to add? No, that's it. It looks like that's it. We are Not all I. talked out. Adrian? Okay. All right. Well, uh, everyone, all thank right. you so like much for joining out. us, especially the strong that survived till the end. Uh, this has been another episode <laughs> of the Retirement Lifestyle Show, and we look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please like, subscribe, give us five stars, and tell your friends about us. Thank you.